pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Welcome, everyone. It's important for Placer County to conduct our business to ensure essential services for our citizens. We're doing everything we can to facilitate residents staying at home and physical distancing. We encourage the public to engage in this process. With that in mind, our public comment for this meeting will be offered in person and through a remote virtual process. Citizens who wish to comment today that did not call the reservation line prior to the start of the meeting should be prepared to comment via the Zoom platform. To join virtually online, click on the link on the Planning Commission homepage. Please make sure your microphone is muted. You may also call in using our toll-free numbers to hear the meeting at 888-788-0099 or 877-853-5247. And please enter the webinar ID 923-5214-0767. Then press uh, star six to mute yourself. If you would like to make a public comment virtually, please raise your hand with a hand icon at the bottom of the page. If you are calling in, please press star nine to raise your hand. Please be prepared to speak at the time I open public comment for the specific item you would like to address, which may include public comment for matters not included on the agenda, a consent item, or a timed item. If attending in person today, we kindly request that once you have commented on your item, return to your seat or leave the hearing room from the exit only door to accommodate for physical distancing and allow for others to provide in-person public comment. Each commenter is entitled to three minutes of comment time. Thank you for your patience as we work to preserve the safety and health of all meeting participants and ensure that each citizen who wishes to comment has the opportunity to do so. Sue, would you call roll? Yes, good morning. Uh, Mr. Cannon. Here. Mr. DeMattei. Here. Mr. Johnson. Here. Mr. Woodward. Here. Mr. Herzog. Here. Mr. Sevison. Larry, you're still on mute. Here. Thank you. And Mr. Haugie. Here. Thank you. All right. Planning director's report, please. No, you don't. Good morning, Chairman and members of the Commission. E.J. Valdi with the Planning Services Division. Uh, let me first update you on Tuesday's board meeting. Uh, at that meeting, the board took up the Crowley Variance Appeal, uh, which your commission recommended a denial of. Uh, the board ended up upholding that appeal and tentatively approved the variance. Uh, they were somewhat sympathetic to the uh, structures that were the structure that was built prior to the owners, uh, the new owners being there. And also uh, the confusion with the website and the agricultural building exemption and how, how that's all uh, listed on the county's website. Uh, so uh, what we're going to do is uh, prepare, prepare some findings for uh, approval and take that back to the board. Uh, I believe March 9th. Uh, and then uh, I'm going to let Clayton talk about the redistricting, but they did take up uh, the redistricting item uh, for 2021 at the board. And uh, so every year, you know, there's uh, every 10 years, uh, we have the census. Uh, everybody's familiar with the U.S. Census as part of that. Uh, the county, every 10 years, goes through a redistricting process. So the board uh, was asked to uh, take into consideration uh, creating an ad hoc committee uh, or creating some other advisory redistricting uh, commission to participate in that process. Uh, Clayton was there on Tuesday for quite the debate. I know some of you heard uh, the discussion, so I'll turn it over to Clayton right now. Yes. Thank you, EJ. Yes, so the board vote on Tuesday was to name the Planning Commission as the Advisory Redistricting Commission for the county. Uh, so basically what that means is uh, there will be a, um, an involved public process that will occur uh, probably over the next uh, eight or nine months, but um, moving uh, probably um, most of them will, it, most of it will occur in that September, October time frame. Uh, the county actually needs to adopt uh, redistricting maps by the end of October. 
um, and we will probably not get census data till um, early September. So basically, uh, your uh, planning commission will be this advisory redistricting commission, which will provide input on the draft redistricting maps. Um, and ultimately, then uh, we'll come up with maps that will be provided to the board for the board to then ultimately decide on whether or not to approve or modify. So a question at this time, how many meetings are you anticipating? And I'm, I'm assuming we kind of block out September, October. Sure. So uh, the statute requires that there be at least four public uh, hearings. Um, there may be more. Uh, there has been discussion uh, among the supervisors about uh, uh, having these uh, discussions with the MACs as well as uh, town hall meetings. So um, I, I'm guessing that we'll be doing more than the, the statutorily mandated amount. Um, but uh, at a minimum, it will be four. Uh, two of those can occur before we get the census data. <clears throat> so that census data we anticipate will get uh, early to mid-September. So we'll have two before then, and then we'll have to have two in that September-October time frame. Four more is required. <laughs> okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Clayton. Uh, so for upcoming Planning Commission meetings, uh, we are going to have a meeting on the February 20. Fifth, depending on the outcome of uh, one of the items we're asking to continue today, and then also March 11th. So uh, things are still pretty, pretty busy moving forward. Uh, and that's all I have. All right. Any questions for the planning director? I, I oh. have a quick question. Yes. In, any plans in the future or near future to go to Tahoe? Or is it just undetermined because of COVID still, or any plans to go there? Uh, we could definitely entertain that. I think, you know, typically we'll go to Tahoe when we have uh, Tahoe items uh, to take up. And so I think, uh, you know, when we, when we get to that point, I think that's a discussion we can have. And uh, I think the board has been up to Tahoe or going to Tahoe uh, in March. So, yeah, so I think it's uh, something feasible. And uh, if we have, you know, enough Tahoe items, I think it's, it would be, uh, I think that's a good idea for the Tahoe community. All right. Thank you. All right. I will now open public comment for any matters not in the Planning Commission agenda. And so soon do we have any raised hands. And is there anyone in the audience who wants to speak? Seeing no one in the audience, so no raised hands. Okay. With no other comment, public comment for matters not on the agenda is closed. We'll now move on the consent agenda. Would any commissioners like to remove one item from the consent agenda? Mr. Chairman, I'd I, I like to move that we approve the consent agenda items. Motion. Uh, before we approve, uh, we, have we should have uh, commissioners uh, determine whether or not they want to remove an item, then allow the public to remove an item. Um, and then assuming okay. none of them want to, then we can so approve. You're moving fast, but are there any commissioners who want to remove one of the items? Seeing none, next, is there anyone from the public who would like to remove a consent item? And I don't see anyone in the audience. Uh, Sue, do we have anyone? No. Okay. So at this time. I'd like to move that we approve the consent agenda items. Do we have second. A second. Okay, we have a first and a second. Sue, roll call. I have a first by Mr. Herzog, a second by Mr. Sevison. So a vote for Mr. Cannon, please. Yes. Mr. DeMatte? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mr. Johnson? No. Yes. Mr. Woodward? Yes. Yeah. Mr. Herzog? Yes. Mr. Sevison? Yes. Mr. Hauge? Yes. Thank you. All right. We are moving on to our first timed item, the Resort Triangle Transportation Plan, RTTP. This is an informational item only. Members of the public may now raise their hands or press star 9 if you're calling in to begin queuing in for public comment on the item, which will not begin until the item presentation is complete. Stephanie Hollow. Oh, no, Stephanie's not. We're, okay. We're tag teaming today. Okay. <laughs> okay, Crystal and Stephanie will tag team today. Thank you. So if you'd present the item. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning, members of the commission. I'm Crystal Jacobson, the deputy director for our Tahoe Cedra office, and with me today is Stephanie Holloway from the county's Department of Public Works office. The item we are presenting to you today is the Resort Triangle Transportation Plan, otherwise known as the RTTP. Um, Stephanie has been leading this effort, um, and we have been coordinating with her on that. Um, 
And as she will note in her presentation, it was adopted back in October by our board. Um, so just to kind of um, discuss the purpose of why we're here today, a few months back we were asked if we can share this presentation uh, to your commission so that you can kind of understand some of the initiatives around transportation and mobility that are underway in our Tahoe region. Um, the Resort Triangle Transportation Plan is just one of those initiatives, um, but it is an important one and it includes multiple components that are aimed at addressing traffic congestion and reducing vehicle miles traveled otherwise known as VMT, so if you hear us speak to VMT, that's what that terminology is. Um, so it's really aimed at, again, addressing traffic congestion and uh, reducing VMT in our Tahoe area. So our goal today is to inform your commission on this effort and then provide uh, for you some important context uh, for you in your decision making on projects in the Tahoe region. So that would be um, anywhere in the North Tahoe area of Placer County. Uh, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Stephanie to walk through the presentation, and then um, I'll, I'll circle back and wrap it up at the end. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Crystal. Again, Stephanie Holloway with the Department of Public Works. Uh, I'm a senior engineer in charge of our transportation planning uh, and traffic engineering group. So I have a presentation that will take me about 20 minutes, and, and uh, I'll be available afterwards for any questions that you have. Um, so I'm pleased and excited to present this plan. We've been working on it for about a year and a half now. Um, and as Crystal mentioned, it was approved by our board back in October of last year. So before I get into the details of the plan, uh, I just wanted to lay the foundation for the need and, and kind of where this came from. So just to kind of high level mention, you know, transportation in our state, uh, in our nation, is really in a, in a process of transition at this time. Um, as transportation practitioners, we're being asked to, to um, adjust um, and, and shift our methods and tools for really trying to connect people uh, from destinations and, and areas of everyday need. Um, our Tahoe region, as many of you know, experiences times of extreme congestion and visitation uh, and long travel delays. And so we've been for, um, ever since I've been with the county, talking about the need to shift away from uh, the use of the private vehicle and, and, and sort of vehicle dependency in this region. Um, but we recognize with this plan and, and through other efforts that that really doesn't happen naturally. Uh, it doesn't happen without some uh, strategies to try to, you know, shift our, our, um, our modes of travel to um, other modes of travel. Um, and so really the plan is, is trying to kind of get at that desire to create behavioral change um, into alternative modes. So I will say that you know the RTTP is designed to create action in this area, and our hope is that it also influences our congested times by creating less uh, less dependency on that vehicle usage. So just to backtrack uh, a little bit, I wanted to mention that you know this effort really arose out of our uh, planning efforts with the Tahoe Basin Area Plan, which Crystal and I were both heavily involved in, and back in 2017 as well as our transit plan, our TART systems plan for the region, which was adopted in 2016. Um, so this plan uh, really is kind of intended to build off of that and seed some of those initiatives that we talked about in the land use plan and the transit plan, bringing it kind of full circle and also bringing it into alignment with the TRPA's transportation plan and their transportation, uh, their, their larger regional plan. Two other efforts I'll mention um, in this context is our board did approve uh, a document for, called the North Tahoe Transportation Demand <coughs> Management Strategies. That was a kind of followed our area plan. It was a request of uh, community members to really take a deeper dive into what those alternative, um, alternative strategies could be for our region. And then also with the state's requirements on vehicle miles traveled, or VMT as Crystal mentioned, um, you know, coming on board with Senate Bill 743, that really does start to shift our focus away from capacity and, uh, of, of vehicles and, and into alternative modes. So that, as you know, went into effect in July of this year. So you'll hear a lot more on Tahoe VMT in the next couple of months, a lot of work and effort going on uh, with TRPA and, and other stakeholders on that. Um, I do want to mention that our, um, that our grant was... Um, 
awarded by Caltrans through their sustainable planning, uh, planning and transportation um, program. So just to talk a little bit about the study area here, uh, the plan does encompass the entire area of Eastern Placer, uh, east of the summit, and in and out of the basin. So that's an important distinction uh, I'll mention a couple times through the presentation. It does cover what we like to refer to as our resort triangle uh, in Eastern Placer. And that, that encompasses essentially the, the, the triangle legs are the highways of 89, 267, and 28. So the, this plan doesn't cover that entire area. So jumping into the plan objectives, uh, you know, the programs, uh, the programs in the plan really do strive to lessen our dependency, as I mentioned, on the private vehicle. Um, we are looking to try to improve the transportation experience for both our residents and our uh, multitude of visitors in this region. And then all the while minimizing our effect on, on the environment. So I just want to stop here and kind of briefly mention that the plan was developed in concert with our um, partners at TRPA and their regional transportation plan, which does um, lay over the basin boundary. Um, their goals here for, the, for their transportation plan are outlined. Uh, but the RTT is really intended to, to bring some more detail to this high-level planning document and kind of bring it home for what is, it, what is this what does this planning document mean for Placer County and how can we work towards implementation of these bigger regional goals? I will also uh, say that the, this, the RTTP tends, uh, strives to really bridge a divide that we recognized in the, in the planning process of the, of the area plan. Uh, and, and what we struggle with in this region is, is really the, the jurisdictional divide in, uh, in uh, the planning regions of TRPA and SACOG. So going back to the map quickly, uh, you can see the basin boundary there. That is TRPA's jurisdiction. Outside the basin, that is actually SACOG's jurisdiction, or, or PCTPA as our regional, um, our transportation planning uh, agency. So, um, so this plan is really kind of striving to overlay those two districts and bring continuity and connectivity between uh, those two regions. So getting into the key focus areas, as I mentioned, we're really kind of taking that regional plan and, and digesting it, trying to make it applicable to Placer County, um, and then also imply, apply those uh, kind of bigger transportation strategies outside of the basin. Um, so I, I will mention that um, you know, the first focus area that I'll talk about in detail is this adaptive corridor management idea. Um, you know, This is really a, a term that we um, adopted from TRPA, and it, it, I think to boil it down, it really kind of addresses our feeder corridors in and out of the region, Highway 89, 267. Uh, these are going to be our long-distance trips, and a lot of times where we tend to focus on travel congestion uh, on peak snow days or hot summer days, we tend to get a lot of um, influx into the region. So really, uh, the key emphasis on, on this strategy is promoting transit and um, looking for strategies to get people on the bus. We do have a fairly robust plan for, for transit, um, but we tend to find that our transit usage isn't increasing as much as we would like it to. So strategies to kind of, you know, uh, again, get people on the bus. Parking management is another focus area I'll talk about. And really, I think just to kind of summarize it, it, it parking management is... It, seen as sort of a tool to help us manage the attractiveness of using that vehicle. How easy, how easy is it to bring that vehicle into the region if you choose to do so? Uh, transportation demand management, as I mentioned, is really focused on those alternative choices to the vehicle. Uh, we'll talk about transit shuttles, but also some measures to try to, um, try to address our, just our, our trip usage by the vehicle and, and bringing that percentage down. And then lastly, I'll, I won't go too much into detail, just kind of by reference and to tell you that there's a huge effort going on on VMT. Um, but it does, uh, you know, we feel like the, the strategies and the programs in this plan do um, address VMT in the sense that um, these are our measures. These are going to be our mitigation for future visitation into the region um, on the issue of, of VMT. So just to quickly talk about the stakeholder engagement, um, we did convene two separate groups. 
One, a, a really technical, uh, our technical partners to help us draft the strategies and get into the weeds on the, the traffic data and, and strategies. Uh, the other was really kind of to get out into the community to provide that local community voice to make sure uh, they were informing um, the final plan as well. And so we did a, a lot of research. You can see here this, this isn't a comprehensive list, but just wanted to kind of highlight um, the collaboration um, that this plan did undertake. So talking about adaptive corridor management in a little more detail, um, like I said, this, this was a term that came up through the area plan. TRPA was really pushing us to be, to think outside the box. Uh, and again, you know, outside of our, re out, of, out of their region, kind of challenging us to, to do better on the corridors. Um, so again, boils down to really utilizing our current infrastructure um, in a more effective way. And, and many, many options were talked about. We talked about bus on shoulder. We talked about um, different kinds of treatments here. But, but this one really kind of rose to the top, uh, was embraced by many, uh, the center running bus only uh, travel lane on Highway 89 and 267. Uh, I think it's important to note here that the recommendations were, were developed in real close com uh, coordination with both Caltrans as the highway operator of both of those roadways, as well as CHP uh, on our enforcement arm. They, they had a lot of uh, operational and just safety concerns about some of the other strategies, and at the end of the day, I think we all felt comfortable with, uh, with this option. So just going into kind of a little more detail on the phases, it is, it is uh, the plan does break this down. Uh, it's a pretty, pretty big undertaking, pretty big project to talk about on these two roadways. Um, but the plan breaks it down into bite-sized uh, steps. So the first phase would be um, updating and, and um, providing some signal modifications at the intersections for transit priority, as well as maybe some queue jump lanes. Again, the, the intersections is where we tend to see the congestion build up first. Um, and so we want to make sure that we're getting that bus out of that congestion and, and trying to prioritize them through those intersections. So that's the short term desire. And, and actually, we have a meeting with Caltrans today to start talking about that. Yeah, go ahead. What's a jump? Jump lane. OK. Sorry. Jump, yeah, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> uh, jargon here. Yeah. So a jump lane is essentially a, a designated lane or a priority lane that's outside of the general uh, vehicle lane along, you know, kind of on, si on the side. You see this a lot in urban areas where the bus has like a, there's like a bus only designated lane at the signal. They approach, they get detected, the signal will phase for them and they, and they get through. So no matter where the signal is at in its cycle, uh, they immediately get the kind of the the indication and they get prioritized through so thank you yeah um, so phase two builds on the intersection improvements but it in phase two we start to connect as you see we start to connect uh, the the priorities and the, and the jump lanes uh, with this center running bus only lane between the intersections there's obviously some challenges on that um, you know especially on 89 um, with some of the infrastructure but that does kind of start to develop in phase two. And then phase three would be a uh, extension of some of the bus truck only climbing lanes over Brockway Summit. Obviously, there's a uh, decent grade there. And so this is one of probably the most challenging pieces uh, of this whole, uh, whole strategy here is, is really on that Brockway Summit piece. So just to jump into parking, um, the second element of our focus area is really parking management in the town centers of Kings Beach and Tahoe City. Um, I will talk a little bit about some, some strategies that we have for um, some recreational sites. But to talk about the town centers, um, you know, these, these are really areas that visitors are drawn to um, naturally. And so we want to create some strategies on just trying to reduce or disincentivize the use of the vehicle in that area. So paid parking is part of that management strategy in the town centers. Um, we would be looking to, to develop a paid parking program on the um, public lots that we uh, own and maintain within Kings Beach, uh, Tahoe City, but also looking to kind of uh, further a, a paid parking strategy on the, the roadways and, and working with the state on the state highway on some paid parking. There is some discussion in the plan about 
recognizing uh, the potential for, for doing paid parking on private properties. Um, we aren't proposing that at this time, uh, but we are setting it up that if, if people are interested in that strategy that we could uh, build a program around, around that. We've been talking a lot with the City of Sacramento on their program and how they uh, incorporate private lots into their, into their bigger management program. Um, there is some recommendations in the plan for pricing, times of enforcement, seasonality, as you can kind of see here on this slide. Um, I think, you know, paid parking, to kind of, again, boil it down, really helps us uh, better manage the stay of that vehicle in the, in the specific areas, so it creates turnover um, and, and also um, acts as a nudge, again, to, to disincentivize vehicle usage and encourage people into alternative choices. Uh, lastly, on parking, I'll just mention that, you know, there is a potential that is a generate, a revenue generator for us as well. We are hopeful that the program, uh, if, if set right, if the fees are set right, will self-fund itself, but there is also potential for um, additional funding to um, help cover the cost of, of some of the other strategies like sidewalks, um, bike lanes, um, potentially some transit shuttles. So, so there's potential there for a revenue source as well. Question? Yeah. Uh, the question is dealing with enforcement. Uh -huh. Will that be CHP or how, how is that going to be enforced? Yeah, so I think that's the detail we're still <coughs> trying to figure out. Um, you know, we have talked a little bit about um, doing that in-house with some county staff and, and uh, we do have some other enforcement, um, enforcement areas that we do already. Uh, we do some uh, enforcement in the winter on our roadways with the, the uh, limitations on, on parking because of snow removal. So I think there's some opportunities there to kind of build off that and expand from the programs that we're already doing. I, I would venture to say that CHP is not going to be interested in, in doing this type of enforcement right. at this point. That's what I would think, too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So just to touch a little bit on the residential parking management piece of this, um, I think it was important as we developed the plan to recognize that whatever we do with paid parking in our town centers in the commercial area is going to have an effect. Uh, and that's going to create spillover into our residential neighborhoods. And so we want to make sure that whatever we do, uh, we are cognizant of that. And so we're recommending uh, a residential parking management program um, and I'm actually suggesting that we stand that up sooner than later. Um, I think we've heard uh, from some of the, the COVID uh, concerns from last summer that, you know, even, even the influx is creating spillover uh, absent a paid parking strategy. So, uh, so I, I think we are recommending that we uh, address that program, uh, you know, on the forefront. So just to give you a graphic of what this might look like, uh, there's... Tahoe City on the left, Kings Beach on the right. Um, you know, the blue, I will say, is the area where we are uh, recommending uh, the paid parking zones. The green is that spillover, the residential area that we think has a potential. The orange on the left is the 64-acre property, and, and I'll talk about this in just a second, but we are recommending a paid parking strategy under the recreational component on that property. Um, and then the orange on the right is the Kings Beach State Rec area. And as some of you know, there's already a, a parking strategy on that lot, uh, state parks. So this is that recreational component that I mentioned a couple of times. Um, these are our high frequency beach areas within, within the, the basin. Um, again, the plan makes some recommendations about uh, time of day, seasonality, and some pricing. Uh, I think one important observation that we learned just through the study of the region is that uh, nearly all the beaches in the Tahoe Basin have some type of paid parking um, strategy already implemented on them, except for in Placer County. And so we are recommending the need for that, and it also um, tends to bring us up to kind of state of the practice for the region. You can see here there's a number of uh, beaches and areas, a 64-acre property, as I mentioned, is on here in the, King, in the Tahoe City area. Uh, state rec on the, on the Kings Beach side, obviously that one already exists. But again, this, there's many of these beaches and, and properties uh, we don't manage or maintain, and so there's going to be a lot of work there on you know, collaborating with those partners and, and talking through what they might 
envision there as well. So moving on to the third element, um, the transportation demand management. There's two pieces of this I'm going to talk about. Um, but again, these two pieces came out of that document that I, that I mentioned the board adopted back in 2019. Um, there's a whole host of, of transportation demand management. But this plan really kind of went into the weeds and into detail on two of those. And so one is microtransit. Um, microtransit uh, really has the uh, benefit of providing sort of that door-to-door -door service. It has the opportunity to really make some key connections um, between our neighborhoods and the town centers, town centers to the recreational piece. Um, you know, it also has the opportunity to create that first mile, last mile, if you've heard that. Uh, in, in our industry, that's that's really the piece that when people get off that main line, the big TART bus, they, they end up at a bus stop. And their, their home, their destination may be a mile or, or a mile and a half from there. And so that becomes a barrier for people wanting to use that main line service because there isn't a, a sort of a door-to-door -door service to complement. So the microtransit has the ability to, to serve that need. Um, it would be on demand, so if you're familiar with the Mountaineer program in Squaw Valley um, or Uber Lyft type service, um, you call it up on your app. Uh, there's very short response times. And then our desire is to potentially uh, coordinate it with our TART system, which is currently in a fare free pilot. So during the outreach, we did poll the community to get a sense of, you know, where is the higher need? Which area of the four areas that we've recommended for uh, microtransit uh, really shows, shows desire and shows need? And you can see from this chart, um, it was a dead tie. <laughs> so, um, so, but we are recommending in the plan that we prioritize the town center areas. So you can see on here, Kings Beach, uh, Tahoe City from dollar, you know, to Dollar Point, Tahoe City to Homewood. Uh, really try, I think our idea with prioritizing the town centers is it really starts to serve as a complement to that paid parking. So as we kind of ratchet down on the parking, we're also providing a service, right? So we're not just saying you can't, but we're saying you can't, but there's options, right? Um, so that, that's kind of the, the reason for us to focus on the town centers. I will say that we're having conversations uh, with town center businesses as well as the West Shore businesses to really trying to stand up a pilot program for microtransit this, uh, this summer even. So our, our transit division is, is working heavily on that right now. So I'll talk a little bit about the second item under transportation demand management, and that is really um, you know, acknowledging the need for additional awareness and promotion uh, of reduction programs uh, and opportunities for those that live and work within the region. A lot of time we get times we get focused on you know, all these people that drive up from the Bay Area, and you know, sort of they're the problem. But it all sort of builds together, right? There's people in the region that are traveling about, and so we want to want to stand up kind of a framework and a and a thought process around you know incentivizing those people that are in the region to use alternative transportation. And so. TRPA is doing some really great work on this right now on their Commute Tahoe program. And so um, we have partnered with them and, and having a lot of discussions around that. Um, we're also recommending sort of building a partnership with businesses because that's typically where people go to work um, and, and trying to really kind of come up with some incentives and, and build some education around the importance of these strategies. Um, I will say off the cuff that, you know, telework has been just a, a wonderful thing for for uh, reducing our sort of our VMT in this region, and so you know having those conversations with businesses about providing those options for their employees uh, is part of this strategy. Um, and then just to be brief, I'll mention the T Truckee North Tahoe Transportation Management Association. That's a lot. Uh, so the TMA, if you uh, if you're familiar. Up there, they're really our partners on marketing and 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 um, specifically this program. You know, working with those businesses and employers, uh, and so we really kind of pulled them in as a key asset, uh, and they'll play a, a key role with our coordination. So, just to talk a little bit about some additional polling we did around uh, this strategy, um, you know, really kind of 
um, finding people that live and work in the region, we found that there was a general support uh, for use of alternative transportation when it was first provided uh, and secondly maintained. And the maintained piece of it is, is really important here. Um, but I think from, from the results here, I mean, this is a pretty, I would say this is a pretty robust mode share uh, example of, of people that kind of work, live and work in this region. Um, they do appreciate those alternative choices uh, to the vehicle and they're using them. So kind of that build it and they will come philosophy I think is very strong and helps uh, encourage us that uh, moving in this direction is the right path. So bringing it back full circle to the, the regional transportation plan, this is, a, this is a modified slide out of TRPA's regional transportation plan. And so if we look at what we're doing in the uh, resort triangle transportation plan and kind of marry that up and match it up to the, the larger transportation plan, um, we can kind of look at what we're doing in their three buckets. So their three buckets are visit Tahoe, so people that come and go from the region, Discover Tahoe, once you're there, where are you going? And then Everyday Tahoe, and that's the people that live and work within the region. Um, so you can kind of see here I have the strategies I've laid out and how they fit into that bigger strategy to really address all of our travelers, all of our visitors within the region, um, potentially with different strategies. So I will say, although our community is excited and ready for these programs, there is a lot of work. <laughs> that was outlined in this, in this program. Uh, and so we're really going through kind of the, the implementation strategy, developing a business plan, trying to figure out where the resources and the needs are for each one of those steps. And so, um, like I said, our board did approve this. We're wrapping up the grant. Um, we're working on an implementation plan. Um, and that is happening uh, as we speak. So. So then moving forward, uh, this is just kind of a series of next steps from the implementation plan. Again, looking to kind of phase it, starting with some focus implementation. You'll, you'll probably hear us talk about some pilots, and I mentioned the microtransit pilot, but also I think that residential parking program is really on the forefront of our minds. Um, and then expanding that as resources come available. And, um, Many of these will work in tandem. Like I said, the, the parking and the shuttle programs, those will probably work in tandem and, and are important to work in tandem because they feed off of each other. Um, so last but certainly not least, you know, continued coordination with TRPA and TTD and PCTPA and SACOG and TMA, all the acronyms, right? <laughs> We're continuing to really be engaged and, and continuing to, to further this bigger idea and, and additionally some bigger funding strategies as well. So, um, so what does that mean for your commission? Uh, I wanted to boil it down for you guys and just to kind of say first, uh, I think it's important that you know that transportation is evolving uh, and evolving from a number of fronts, specifically in the Tahoe area. Um, you know, our focus on solving congestion no longer predominantly is tied to building more infrastructure, but really being more efficient and finding alternative modes, uh, and then nudging people into those modes, right? Um, you'll, you will hear us talk about VMT mitigation. Uh, you won't talk, hear us talk about LOS mitigation, unless it's under the context of the general plan and, and consistency in those policies. But as we talk about CEQA, VMT is going to be kind of our language of choice. Um, I will say that DPW is also working on an update to our Tahoe transportation fees or our traffic fees, as you've heard me talk about them historically, uh, those have been really focused on level of service strategies. So building more roads, building bigger intersections, more signals. Um, that program is really um, best used as a tool for mitigation for projects. And so we want to we want to evolve, right? We want that mitigation program to evolve from a, a LOS-based program to a VMT-based program. And so that's kind of a parallel effort that my team's working on uh, in Tahoe specifically, but then you know we'll, we'll capture a lot of the other programs throughout the county. Um, really, I think that helps serve as a benefit for development as they move forward to be able to pay a fair share into these re really regional strategies that help us move the needle on, on VMT and, and uh, vehicle usage. 
So I'll just close by saying, you know, between transit service and expansion, park and ride lots, all of the RTTP strategies that we've laid out and, and many other strategies, um, you know, we're really um, hoping to kind of, you know, bring all these elements together and, and we think that that will help move us through this time of transition and transportation. So I'm going to hand it back to Crystal. She's going to close out and then I'm available for any questions that you might have. Thank you, Stephanie. You're welcome. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, so really, as Stephanie noted, you know, the, the purpose really is what does that mean for your commission? What does it mean for land development in the Tahoe region? As she mentioned, we are moving away from level of service um, and, and moving towards VMT um, as we analyze the projects as planners and uh, our development team uh, here in CEDRA are analyzing um, projects under CEQA. Um, as Stephanie mentioned, we are, her team's working on a transportation fee update for Tahoe um, that will identify capital projects that uh, would offset um, uh, or mitigate VMT impacts in addition to level of service impacts. Um, the RTTP could, um, parts of the RTTP or components of it could be included in that in terms of the capital pieces, like for corridor, um, corridor improvements, for example. Um, but it's important to note that the fee update really is only one, we see that as only one mitigation path for projects that come before your commission. Um, and the RTTP is really one effort underway that will essentially stand up or could stand up as mitigation for, for projects. There are other mobility and active transportation efforts underway. There are a lot of them, um, not just the RTTP. Uh, that are, are really more service oriented. So they are providing for micro shuttles, for example, or expanded and enhanced transit, um, uh, bike share programs, those kinds of things uh, that could also mitigate, um, provide a mitigation path for VMT. So there's a concerted effort in North Lake Tahoe to focus on regional solutions uh, to address, address VMT and address congestion in the Tahoe area. And those solutions are essentially uh, to mitigate, I would say, the region's, re region's impact, understanding that that impact, uh, a lot of folks under, under, or think that that impact is largely related to our tourist-based economy um, and the visitorship that we experience as a result of that in Tahoe. Um, so what we are doing now is to frame up, we're looking at framing up a regional approach or a mitigation strategy rather than having projects mitigate on a case-by-case -case basis, um, the project by project. So essentially the county and our partners are uh, kind of looking to, we're, we're really pushing to look at the bigger picture in terms of the overall sort of traffic and congestion and mobility issues that we hear about, we are experiencing in Tahoe, um, and identifying a, a cohesive approach to kind of better serve the Tahoe region. Um, so as projects come forward before your commission, you often hear, I know for the, for the commissioners that have been here a while, you hear about the issues around traffic. Um, so we're currently exploring the development of a VMT mitigation program uh, for the North Lake Tahoe area. And I say we, that's the county. We're talking about that. That would essentially provide another mitigation path. So in addition to that fee program, we're looking at developing a mitigation program uh, that would, um, that would, I, that would uh, create another mitigation path for projects that are coming before your commission. So with that, we hope that this presentation uh, helped to provide uh, some context in terms of uh, the work that is underway in the Tahoe area to address transportation, uh, VMT, traffic congestion. Um, and we hope it also helped to inform you as you consider future land use development projects. And we'd be happy to answer any questions if you have them. Thank you, Crystal. Questions? I think Rick, Rick has yeah. questions. I guess, uh, actually, it's a very good presentation. So really appreciated that. A lot of good work that went into this. So. Yeah. I wanted to compliment you on that. One of the questions that I come from is, uh, well, you know, I used to work for the National Forest. And you mentioned beaches and parking and those types of issues, which, uh, you know, the county's effort, I guess through TPA, TPRA, but the county's effort really can't influence that other than influencing it, I guess, through uh, working with them. Because uh, like particularly for the national forests or the state parks, they're going to have to come up with different rules to accommodate. So, you know, their beaches don't get uh, all the traffic while your beaches don't get any traffic, you know, and that, those types of issues. So at any rate, just a thought, you know, I, when you mentioned all the different agencies, acronyms, yeah. you, you didn't mention state parks and 
national yeah. forests. And so I think those will be key contacts to uh, work through to make sure that there's a balance there. And they can. You know, I know they can because uh, the national forest system can establish uh, forest orders, which could actually do. So there's a kind of a major coordination effort there that probably is in the offing. Yeah, no, I so totally agree. I mean, <clears throat> I would just say on that, I mean, you know, the, the national forests and those opportunities for recreation in this region are really the primary factor why people go to the, they go to the, see the lake, they go to use the trails, they go to see the forest. Um, and that is something that, you know, our land use decisions sort of pale in comparison to that, attract, that, that attractiveness, right? Um, and so that, as Crystal mentioned, we're trying to, you know, kind of think of the big picture, make sure all of those other stakeholders uh, and that, you know, I kind of think about it as a big machine. You know, we're, we're part of that big machine, but there, it's, it's a bigger issue than just us. And so coordinating and kind of having this conversation with TRPA, it's even bigger than TRPA. Um, and so, yeah, I think national, uh, state parks, national parks, they're all going to play uh, a big role in kind of managing the attraction. Right, that's kind of where we're at. Is you know we, we want to manage, we, we want to provide the resource uh, in a way that it's managed and it doesn't destroy the resource at the same time. I guess one one area that frequently comes up, and I appreciate what you just yeah. said, and of course you already do it, I'm sure. So, but at any rate, like uh, one example that I can think of that often comes up is rafting, which the county manages, but the national forest has got a parking lot there where people just come up and use a parking lot. And go rafting, and oftentimes, you know, the county's uh, rafting people have to do the cleanup and manage that too. So that's maybe one example of a conflict that you have that yeah, could absolutely. be dealt with. Okay, right. so I appreciate what you're saying. I know yeah. you're already working on that. So yeah, thank you very absolutely. much. Yeah. Thank you. Other questions or comments from the commission? I have a question oh. about the jump lanes with your bus. Um, where is that <laughs> jump over at the signal? The signal. Like they get to go before everybody else in the middle, so it's not going to cross over lanes or anything like that, correct? Um, well, it depends on where the bus is going. Um, like at Squaw Valley Road, the bus does, you know, travel up and down 89. It turns and goes up Squaw Valley Road. Mm -hmm. So uh, where it does turn and go up one of our local roads, um, the, the signal would hold it all red, and the bus would get the priority, priority through that. Yep. Now, extending this, is this going to go up to 89 to 267, I heard you say, to go in towards Kings Beach as well? and how would that work, and how, who are you expecting to ride these buses? Are you expecting them to get off in Truckee and get on this bus and then take it into Tahoe? Is that the forecast for this? That, that is the initial big idea, is that you know, people that come from outside the region might stop at one of our park and ride lots. And we, we currently do actually, um, in, a, in our peak peak times, 4th of July, um, we do run that service on the, in, actually in, in some of the uh, winter months. Uh, we have a park and ride contract with uh, properties within the town and the airport district uh, where people can go. They can, you know, drop their car there and get on the bus. Uh, if you've sat on 89 for four hours trying to get to Squaw Valley, um, you know, that that is a viable option. Um, uh, so, yeah, it, it would essentially um, create that environment for you to leave your vehicle, come into the region without, into the region of the basin without the vehicle. So are these going to accommodate skiers? So i got to unpack all my ski gear, throw it on this bus, then get on love of this bus with my kids. And I'm just trying to play yep. devil's advocate with these people who are coming up to I'm go with ski. You. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, same yeah. with the, you know, the people going to Kings Beach and i got to unload my cooler and my kids and their yeah. little wakeboards, whatever yeah. they're taking on the beach. I mean, so, I'll just say I, the strategy is not for everybody, and right. we recognize that. I mean, I'm a mother of two kids. I... I hear you. Like, I just the thought of that makes me cringe. But uh, I think there are users that could choose to do that. Um, and um, I think in, in studying other regions, other ski, you know, ski resort regions, there are other models for that that are successful, too. Cool. So, yeah. Awesome. Huh? Great presentation, by the way. Yeah. You're welcome. Thanks. Just yes. make a quick comment. Thank you. We all know that this is needed in this area and in and, and a collaborative approach to it. And, I really like the graph where you thought about the three different targets and incentives about the folks that are in the region. Um, in, any any detail about collaboration with the resorts themselves, where a large population of these folks might leave from and want to go back to, and th those resorts may be good um, 
good uh, collaborations. Yeah, and I, I'll say on the resort front, I mean, they, they have been at the table with us for a long time. They are key partners for us in the region. Uh, they're actively involved in the TMA, the, the Tahoe, anyways, the TMA. Um, and um, they, are, they have been very helpful and, and uh, collaborative on, you know, um, just their own strategies for managing their demand, right? Uh, North Star already has, uh, you know, stood up sort of this bus service that they do on high-frequency weekends. Uh, they partner with us on the park and ride uh, strategies um, during the winter months. So absolutely, they're, they're constantly there at the table with us, and, and we're, um, you know, kind of leveraging them as, as some of our key partners. So. Other comments? Well, thank you. Um, You're welcome. I know I've been looking at this since 1975, so it's good to see <laughs> progress being yes. made. Thank you. Um, I'd like to open up to public comments at this point in time. Uh, do we have anyone in the audience? And then, Sue, do we have any raised hands? Oh. So we'll close the public comment period. Uh, any final comments from the commission? All right. The next timed item is a Verizon Tahoe Vista Cellular Facility Conditional Use Permit. Members of the public may now raise their hands, press star 9 if you're calling, to begin queuing in for public comment on the item, which will not begin until the item presentation is complete. Steve Bellina, a supervising planner, will be presenting the item. Steve. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Commissioners, I'm Steve Bielma, uh, Supervising Planner in the Tahoe office. Uh, today I'm bringing forward uh, the re to the right slides here. The reapplication of a permit that your Planning Commission approved in April of 20, uh, 2018. The permit itself would have qualified for an extension of time. However, this request was not made of the county prior to the uh, expiration date, and um, as a result. Um, I'm bringing forward uh, an application for um, your consideration today for a conditional use permit that would allow for the installation of a 75-foot tall monopine uh, cellular facility near the maintenance building at the old Brockway Golf Course, which is located in the Tahoe Vista area. As I'm sure you're all aware, as technology has changed over the years, residents and first responders have become more and more reliant on cellular communication for daily activities and as well as for emergencies. This is particularly the, the case at, at those times in the Tahoe region um, where we experience dramatic fluctuations in population, um, particularly around the holiday uh, time, time frames. In order to keep up uh, with the demand placed on the facilities, the applicant has proposed this new facility in the Tahoe Vista area. I should note one of the primary driving forces um, in bringing this application before had to do with the impacts on the emergency services. Uh, a lot of their mobile um, uh, computer uh, uh, technology was heavily impacted during these time periods, which, as you can imagine, uh, created an, an issue for our first responders. So this is what had prompted the request in uh, 2018 and still the case today. I should note that the project that your commission approved in uh, 2018 and what I'm bringing forward uh, to you today is uh, exactly the same. There are no changes whatsoever to the, to the project itself. Just to give you an idea of where this project is located, um, going straight, uh, here's the vicinity map just to give you an idea of the area. Um, the project site is all outlined in red. Um, you can see right there, um, we've got an arrow uh, which indicates uh, where this cellular um, monopine is, is to be located. Uh, just for reference, um, this is State Route 267, um, and here is State Route uh, 28. Um, the uh, access to the property is actually right here off of Beach Street. And as you go through the residential area, um, the paved section will actually terminate and uh, it goes to an unimproved section just before you get to the maintenance building. Just to the west of, of this roadway is where um, the proposed lease area, which is um, 30 foot by 30 foot, is, is to be located. And again, uh, the maintenance building is for the old Brockway golf course, which the area outlined in red um, encompasses a significant portion of the, the golf course area itself. 
So uh, this particular uh, parcel or, or lot is uh, 51.36 acres in size and, as I mentioned, uh, encompasses um, a significant portion of the golf course area. Um, as you can see from this slide, there are two zone di districts uh, present on this parcel. The significant portion of it is uh, contained within the residential zone district. However, the, um, where the lease area is sited is actually in the recreational zone district. Key distinction there is cellular facilities in the recreational zone district do require a uh, conditional use permit, and um, that's uh, the reason for bringing this forward to your commission today. This is a little bit better picture, which will help to highlight uh, where the golf course area is located. As you can see, there's a mixture of pines and firs throughout the, um, the site, as well as the um, golf course property as well. Um, as I mentioned, um, access to the property goes through residential area. Um, I will note that the closest residence to this facility is 150 feet um, to the south of the proposed installation. Here's a site plan which helps to illustrate um, where the lease area is located. Um, the lower left-hand corner here is Beach Street. And then, as I mentioned, as you continue on um, up here uh, towards the top of the slide is the uh, maintenance um, building for the, the golf course. Um, as I mentioned, in the dimensions of this uh, enclosure is 30 foot by 30 foot. Um, around the perimeter, uh, the applicant proposes a 10 foot tall fence. The lower two feet will be a, a concrete block with um, eight foot boards um, installed on the top. Inside, the, inside this, um, this lease area will be a 75 foot tall uh, monopine, uh, which will measure 80 feet tall uh, once the uh, foliage is, is installed on the, on the cell tower. Just to the north of the monopine, um, there's a proposal for a 45 kilowatt um, diesel generator as well as a 210 gallon uh, fuel tank. Um, it's important to note that the primary source of power for the cellular facility is not the, the generator. The generator is installed just uh, for instances of inclement weather or power outages or emergencies where a backup uh, power source may be required. Here's some elevations of the proposed uh, facility. Um, the monopine itself is intended to accommodate antennas consisting of 15 RRHS units, three RACAP surge suppressors, six Verizon wireless antennas, and two hybrid, uh, hybrid cables. This particular area of the county um, requires that design site review approval uh, be conducted for um, this particular installation. Um, this project's had the benefit of going before the design, design Review Committee, which is a citizens group that offers guidance to county staff and provides a recommendation uh, on projects such as this. Um, I will note that uh, the Design Review Committee spent a significant amount of time um, discussing um, things which you'll actually see in a, a subsequent slide here, um, which had to do with probably the most visible aspect of uh, this installation, which was the, the fence. Um, they provided um, some recommendations on ways to have the um, colors and, and staining so that it would blend into the environment as, as much as possible. At that same meeting, um, they also spent um, quite a bit of time uh, discussing the uh, foliage that would be um, ultimately selected for this installation so that it would match the trees that are in that area as closely as possible. So with a lot of these, um, these projects, we ask that uh, visual simulations be provided so we get a better gauge of what this is going to like, look like in the real world. Um, this particular vantage point is on State Route 28, which we saw in the former slide, um, headed east towards the uh, state line. Um, I wouldn't spend a significant amount of time looking for the, um, the cellular installation because it's really difficult to, to see, if, if at all. This next slide, however, um, is taken from the end of Beach Street as you're looking towards the maintenance facility. Um, from this slide and, and on the projector, it's a little bit more difficult to, to see, but the um, on, only aspect that you can really see is not so much the monopine, but the, uh, the fence location. And this is one of the key aspects that the design review committee picked up on and the reason for the uh, conditions for the design review that will um, address the uh, color selection for that fencing. 
In reviewing this project, um, county staff looked at a number of different um, uh, topics um, for review. One was the Tahoe Basin area plan and zoning consistency, as I mentioned. Uh, in the recreational zone district, um, this does require a conditional use permit. Um, staff took a look at the findings required for that and uh, was uh, comfortable with a favorable recommendation. I will note on the Tahoe Basin Area Plan, one of the policies that's contained in that is uh, to ensure that there, a project that's brought forward in that area does not, negative, uh, does not have a negative impact on the recreational opportunities. Um, and taking a look at where this proposal is located, um, we felt comfortable that um, there would not be an impact on the recreational opportunities, either golf course or passive recreation. Neighborhood compatibility was probably um, more of an issue with the proposal before we even brought it to your planning commission in 2018. The original uh, proposal from Verizon Wireless cited this location in the residential area off of Brassy as opposed to on the golf course. Um, because of concerns that were raised, um, we had discussions with the applicant, and we found this um, a much more favorable location. Uh, particularly due to the um, 150 feet from the closest residence, as well as um, the, the lack of visibility from the, the location that was selected. Um, tree removal was another uh, element that we uh, took a look at. There is one 36-inch pine that is proposed to be removed as part of this installation. Um, as with many projects in this area, that will be required to go through the Tau Regional Planning Agency for approval. And as part of that process, um, there will be, um, the tree removal will be um, reviewed and, and approved as, as part of that. Um, we did take a look at noise. Um, as I mentioned, the, uh, the generator that's proposed is really only, the only time it will be operated is for routine maintenance, which occurs every few weeks for probably a maximum of 15 minutes, or in the event of an emergency where there's a massive power outage. Um, so with all that, um, we feel confident that um, it will, in fact, comply with the, the North Placer County Noise Ordinance. Um, the last item I wanted to uh, discuss, discuss just briefly was uh, discontinu discontinuation of use. This is one of the items that was brought forward or um, raised by your Planning Commission when it went to hearing in 2018. The concern there is that if Verizon chooses to no longer use this facility, um, your commission wanted to make sure that uh, the facility wouldn't remain there and um, end up in a, a state of disrepair. As such, condition number 19 was crafted, which requires that if county staff determines that the cellular facility has not been, has gone into a non-use state for a period of 12 months, that the applicant will have 180 days to remove that, that uh, facility, which the timing was debated back and forth, and a lot of that had to do with the uh, construction season up in the, um, the snow country in, in Tahoe. So with all that, um, staff's recommendation for PLN 2000301 is for approval, subject to the findings and conditions of approval as they appear in your staff report. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions should you have any. All right, thank you, Steve. Any questions of the commission? Yeah. Did you say yes? Yeah. Okay, Rick Hassel. Okay. Thank you. Let me see. I think I heard you mention. Yeah, excuse me. Yeah. yeah sorry. Can't let you escape yet. In a minute. In a minute. At least as far as I'm concerned. Let me see. I think I heard you mention that it's adjacent to a maintenance building. Correct. Okay. Yes. And I can go right back to that slide real quick here. So on the site plan here, um, again, through the, re the residential area would be located down here. This is Beach Street that comes in. So the, um, the lease area uh, will be located right here, and your ma uh, maintenance facility for the golf course is located right up here. Okay, I'm not seeing a little dot here. Where is it located? Oh, sorry, right up here. Okay, and so the maintenance is way down below? Yes, so the, um, here's a, the lease area, so it would be just, just before you get to the, uh, the maintenance facility. Oh, so there's a building already next to it? There is, there's no building there um, yet, but there'll be a, a fenced area um, there, but um, just probably 100 yards or so uh, to the north is the maintenance facility or the golf course that, okay. that's currently there. Okay, I was looking at a map here that showed the dot 
actually being on a building. So I was oh. wondering if what it was. So is this the same location that we were here before? Yes. Okay. Yes. And then another question, I guess this might be a little abstract, but when you're talking about emergency services, mm -hmm. if inside the basin, of course, they you know, zero in on the Verizon, but uh, for out of basin fire folks that come to this area, of course, there's a larger system that actually has a contact with AT&T. So a lot of the out of, out of area emergency service providers are going to be using the AT&T or want to use the AT&T system. And so I guess it's not a requirement, but I guess I understand that when they build these towers, there is room on the towers for other providers to uh, provide, I mean, get access to it. Is that true? Typically, that that is the case. And what would happen is if, say, another um, facility wanted to locate their antennas on, on this, uh, it would come in through a building permit, and then county staff would determine whether or not there is additional permitting uh, requirement um, necessary to, to bring it forward to your commission or approve it through an, another means with a co-location. Okay, so this is being built by Verizon, but if AT&T wanted to put their stuff on it, they could do that, probably. Yeah, we, but, we do see quite a bit of that with the cellular installations that, um, you know, new technology for antennas might be required that would, would come back um, through a, a building permit and then um, have the opportunity for all uh, departments and divisions to take a look at, at that and see if there's additional permitting requirements. Okay, just, just wanted really to bring that up because when you're talking about emergency services, the people in the basin are going to use the Verizon, but out of basin people might need the AT&T. Sure. So thank you. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Nathan? Yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> mine is about the fence. Uh, we've talked about in the past with, with these issues of the fencing around being wood is concerning. Uh, I know it's going to be a two-foot block wall with on top of that a wooded fence. Um, I'd really like to consider a different material for that, uh, especially with that much fuel being right there. Um, want to be sensitive to, to fires and try to do what we can to avoid, you know, encouraging, you know, more fuel being burned. Um, it, it, is, is there other fencing uh, that's being considered in this as well? That was the, the fencing that um, has been proposed and, you know, was presented before the design review committee. Um, I know, uh, you know, oftentimes like the cyclone fencing and, and things of that nature are not overly consistent with the um, requirements of the Tahoe Regional Planning Agency, um, but it would certainly be something we could, we could consider. Okay. I'd like to encourage just different material being used in wood if we can. Okay. Other questions of the commission? All right. At this time, um, thank you, Steve. Yep. Uh, we'll open up the public comment period. Anyone in the audience? No? That's a good idea, Sue. So the applicant's online, so uh, go ahead and let's have the applicant speak. <clears throat> Mr. Lobo? Hi there. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Uh, uh, good afternoon. My name is Mark Lobo. I'm with Epic Wireless here today before you representing Verizon. Uh, I just wanted to make a couple points. Uh, this, this tower is designed already to accommodate a second carrier, and it's depicted on our elevations. Uh, you'll notice a second center line. The antenna center line is already depicted. So, yes, if AT&T or any other carrier came along, we could certainly accommodate them. Thank you. Uh, I also wanted to point out the fact that TRPA uh, has already reviewed and approved uh, our application. And uh, they, they did a quite a thorough review. And so <clears throat> just making you aware of that, if you weren't already aware. Um, then I just wanted to make myself available for any further comments or questions that you might have. Does the commission have questions for the applicant? Uh, seeing none, thank you very much for uh, your information. Thank you. So now we'll open uh, the public comment. So do we have any raised hands? Ms. Nee. Ms. Niefer, you have three minutes. Please make, please unmute your mic. 
I'm sorry, there must have been a misunderstanding. It's for the next agenda item. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? No. All right. With that, we'll close the public comment period. Uh, discussion by the commission or a motion? Okay, I'll make a motion that we uh, find that the project is categor categorically exempt from review under CEQA pursuant to the provisions of Section 15303 of the California Environmental Quality Act guidelines and Section 18.36.050 of the Placer County Environmental Review Ordinance, Class 3, New Construction or Conversion of Small Structures, supported by the finding contained in the staff report. All second. second. Okay. Oh, excuse me. Yeah, go ahead. We have a first and a second. Roll call, please. The first from Mr. Johnson was the second, Mr. Na uh, Herzog? Actually, no, the second was Larry. Okay, I heard two. So a second by Mr. Sevison. So a vote from Mr. Cannon, please. Yes. Mr. DiMatte? Yes. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Woodward? Yes. Mr. Herzog? Yes. Mr. Sevison? Yes. Mr. Haugie. Yes. Thank you. Could you go to the next slide? Thank you. Okay, well, I guess I will carry on again. So uh, I move that we approve a condition use permit to allow for the construction of a cellular facility. The proposed facility will consist of the installation of a 75 foot tall monopine, 80 foot with foliage with attached antennas and a diesel generated all contained within a 30 by 30 foot lease area surrounded by a 10 foot high fence on a portion of the Brockway Golf Course course, west of the parking area and maintenance building supported by the findings and recommended conditions of approval contained in the staff report. Second. All right, we have a first and a second. I have a first for Mr. Johnson, a second for Mr. Sevison. So vote for Mr. Cannon, please. Yes. Mr. DiMatte? Yes. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Woodward? Yes. Mr. Herzog? Yes. Mr. Sevison? Yes. And Mr. Haugie? Yes. Thank you. All right, I believe that's all the motions. So, uh, one of just, what's that? Yes, I'm just ready to read that. <laughs> so, uh, the Planning Commission has recommended approval of this uh, permit. Uh, if you would like to appeal it, the decision of the Planning Commission may be appealed by anyone who appeared at today's hearing and provided comment or anyone that submitted written comments on this item. An appeal must be filed within 10 days of today's date and shall be accompanied by filing fee of $619. Thank you. All right, the next time item is the Bigford Ranch Specific Plan First Amendment to the Corrected, Amended, and Restated Development Agreement to clarify uh, park CFD obligations. Members of the public may now raise their hands or press star nine if you're calling in to begin queuing in for the public comment in the item, which will not begin until the item presentation is complete. Michelle Kingsbury, Principal Management Analyst for Cedra, will be presenting the item. So, Michelle. So good morning, Commissioners. Michelle Kingsbury, Analyst with the Community Development Resource Agency. Uh, this item before you today, as you mentioned, is to consider a recommendation to the board to adopt an ordinance amending the corrected, amended, and restated development agreement for the Bickford Ranch specific plan to clarify the use of re reserves uh, from County Service Area 28 Zone of Benefit 184 upon dissolution and to clarify conditions of acceptance for park facilities once sufficient uh, community facilities district revenues are in place uh, to support increased maintenance levels. Uh, for background purposes, as you're probably aware, uh, the Bigford Ranch specific plan is located off Sierra College Boulevard and State Route 193 between the City of Lincoln and the communities of Penryn and Newcastle. Uh, the specific plan is a planned development uh, for 1,890 residential units. Uh, the requested amendments um, relate to the 2015 uh, corrected and amended and uh, development agreement and it's for two specific technical fiscal issues and I'll go through those real quickly. 
Uh, the first item, uh, staff proposes the amendment to section 3.4.2 so that it clarifies and aligns with an existing provision in the development agreement, section 4.7.1, which discusses and clears up that once our parks zone of benefit is dissolved and a new community facilities district for parks is established, any funds remaining in the zone of benefit account would be transferred to the newly established parks community facilities district. This modification uh, simply um, serves to extinguish any potential um, interpretation inconsistencies in the development agreement. Um, there's currently between those two sections an inconsistency and this amendment just aligns both of those sections in the development agreement. As I mentioned, it's a very technical um, amendment to the, that section. The second amendment, the staff proposes to add um, a sentence um, in section 4.6.4, .4, which clearly states that the county reserves the right to delay acceptance of park facilities until such time as sufficient revenues from the um, CFD are in place to support the enhanced maintenance levels and that clarify that the developer agrees to maintain said facilities until such time as accepted by the county. Um, those are the two specific sections of the um, development agreement that we propose for amendment. Uh, the developer has signed uh, the agreement and supports um, these changes. Except as specifically noted today in those two sections, all other terms and conditions uh, are in full force and effect and remain for the 2015 development agreement. There are no proposed um, changes to the project or any EIR mitigation measures or anything like that. This is simply just a technical um, amendment, a proposed amendment to the development agreement. Um, with that, um, this is a short and brief presentation, but certainly happy to answer any questions that you or right. may have. We have at least one question. I just wanted to be, I think I understand it, but I wanted to be clear sure. on it. And basically, uh, as houses are being built, they're going to pay it. There's going to be a certain amount, for, a little over $4,000 that goes into the, uh, the uh, district, the park district. And of course, I think what it recognizes, of course, is that the, uh, you know, if you, if you just build one house, that's not enough money to pay for the park. And right. so I think what you're doing is providing for construction of the parks and the trails, and that's what's involved here. I guess what I think I heard too, and that's what I wanted to clarify is, uh, of course, once the project is built out, then there's going to be a park district that's uh, continuing to maintain all the developments, the infrastructure. But I think what I'm hearing is that that'll be there'll be a uh, on the on the taxes, the property taxes, there'll be taxes that for the park district that uh, will go into into force once the uh, construction is done and maintenance is necessary. Am I reading that right? Um, yes, I can clarify though. So the Bigford Ranch specific plan, as you're aware, has private parks and county maintained parks. So we're specifically discussing the county maintained parks. Um, for the two sections we're proposing uh, for amendments. The first section really just clarifies there's um, competing language between two sections as to where the reserve funds that are currently held in the zone of benefit, once it's dissolved, where does it go? And so we're just clarifying that once that zone of benefit is dissolved and we form a new community facilities district to provide those revenues to maintain the county parks, that the reserve funds in the zone of benefit just transfer to the CFD. There was two sections that had uh, competing language and we just want to make sure that those sections, there's no misinterpretation as to where that, those funds will go. As to the second section, and that speaks to, I think, your overall question that we propose for amendment, is that you're right. As homes are being built, they're paying on their property tax bills, the special taxes that go to support the maintenance of those county facilities. And we, the Parks Department had just requested some specific language to clarify that until such time as we generate sufficient revenues that we won't be accepting those said park facilities. Um, and, and the developer would maintain those until we have that um, revenue level to support those facilities. Okay. That well, thank sense. you. I just wanted to make sure that I understood what was going on. You got it. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, it's very technical. Apologize. 
I'm assuming they're going to be creating the CFD before they sell lots. Yes, the CFD is required to be created prior to the small lot map being finalized, okay. and this these, this language is resulting from those negotiations and discussions with the development team. All right. Uh, if there's no other comments of the commission, does the applicant uh, or the developer have a comment? Uh, no. Uh. All right. Thank you. At this time, then, uh, let's open the public comment. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to speak? Seeing none, sued. Is there anyone? Who, yes, we have some raised hands. Ms. Neifer, please unmute your mic. You have three minutes. Hi, I'm Patty Neifer. I'm a Pendron resident, and thank you for the explanation of the um, the reserve proceeds and the acceptance of the new park facilities. It doesn't look like it has anything to do with when the park facilities, as specifically the trails, um, would get um, would open to access to the public. So my comment basically was, um, isn't relevant anymore. I wanted to make sure that once phase one is started, that the promised trail access, uh, kind of a loop trail, um, would still be part of the, um, the construction. Um, the other question I did have, or comment I have is, it looks like there's also an exemption um, request from the um, California Environmental Quality Act as part of this motion, and I, I didn't hear that explanation. Um, that's my only comment. All right, thank you. Are there, are there other comments? Okay, no. So if you could explain the CEQA. Uh, sure. As to the first action where we're requesting the exemption and findings that are in the staff report, as I mentioned earlier, these are technical administrative um, amendments to the development agreement and do not change the project nor mitigation measures. So that's why we're asking for the exemptions. There's no changes to any impacts. All right. Thank you. With that, uh, we'll close the public hearing. Um, commission discussion and motion. I just I, I hope that becomes a precedent that if if the county doesn't have the funds to maintain a park that the you know the the developer would would have the responsibility to maintain that until that's there. Um, so I just hope that becomes a future expectation that we don't have to have a separate approval for. Okay. Yeah. It's always typically implied. This is probably the first time we've specifically expressed it in a development agreement. Okay. Do we have a motion? Yeah, I'll move All right. um, that we recommend the Board of Supervisors make a finding of exemption from the Environmental Quality <coughs> Act in accordance with Public Resources Code sections 21166 and CEQA guidelines sections 15162, 15182, and 15183. I'll second that. We have a first and a second. Sue, roll call. I have a first from Mr. Herzog, a second from Mr. DiMattei. Could I please have a vote from Mr. Cannon? Yes. Mr. DiMattei? Yes. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Woodward? Yes. Mr. Herzog? Yes. Mr. Sevison? Yes. Mr. Hauge? Yes. Thank you. I'll further <coughs> move that we recommend the Board of Supervisors adopt an ordinance amending the corrected, amended, and restated development agreement to clarify the use of reserve proceeds Proceeds from County Service Area 28, Zone of Benefit 184, upon dissolution and clarified condition for acceptance of park facilities. Once sufficient community facilities district revenues are in place to support increased maintenance levels for the Bickford Ranch specific plan property owners. I'll second that. We have a first and a second. Roll call, please. First from Mr. Herzog, a second from Mr. DiMattei, and a vote from Mr. Cannon, please. Yes. Mr. DiMattei? Yes. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Woodward? Yes. Mr. Herzog? Yes. Mr. Sevison? Yes. Mr. Hauge? Yes. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. The next timed item is the Housing Related Code Amendments Draft Environmental Impact Report, public review and comment. Members of the public may now raise their hands or press star nine if you're calling to begin queuing in for public comment on this item. 
which will not begin until the item presentation is completed. Patrick Dobbs, Senior Planner, will be making the uh, presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. I'm Patrick Dobbs uh, with the Placer County Planning Services Division. And the item before you today uh, does not require any action from the Commission. Uh, we are here to take public comment on the draft EIR for the Housing Related Code Amendments. <clears throat> The uh, state encourages municipalities to hold public hearings on draft EIRs. That is the county's policy. The Planning Commission will later this spring uh, have uh, be making a recommendation to the Board of Supervisors regarding the, the merits of the proposed amendments. So uh, this hearing is really just to review the adequacy of the draft EIR and not an opportunity to debate the merits of the project. That will come later. Uh, so again, we're just really looking for feedback on how uh, have all of the impacts been considered and have they been properly mitigated. Uh, these are county initiated uh, amendments. These are uh, resulting from changes to state law, what's been found to be successful in other jurisdictions, feedback that we've received from uh, local builders regarding barriers to housing development in Placer County. Uh, the housing code update is programmatic. These are amendments to uh, county policies, development regulations, and process. We've been working on it since 2019. Uh, the project objectives are to increase the availability and mix of housing types, uh, to bring the ha uh, county housing policies, ordinances, and standards uh, consistent with state housing law. I'm going to touch on Senate Bill 35 uh, shortly. This is really implementing existing general plan and community plan policies that support housing development through higher density, mixed use, transit oriented, and infill types of development. Uh, so th th these are policies and, and programs that now we're getting to implement. Um, it's really a focus on existing commercial and multifamily uh, areas. This is uh, an effort to reduce vehicle miles traveled and, and how people get uh, around. Uh, we've been doing a lot of this in various specific plans and area plans and community plans throughout the county where we have very specific development standards or more flexibility for mixed use types of projects. So this is uh, our effort to align the general plan, the zoning ordinance and the design manual with, with these other uh, more concentrated uh, but similar efforts that have been done in various specific plans or area plans. And finally, uh, to implement the board adopted strategic plan which supports uh, new construction of housing for all income ranges for existing and future residents. So these amendments uh, do apply throughout all areas of the unincorporated county. They really are focused on promoting infill, uh, creating this more compact mixed use development, uh, removing barriers to uh, underutilized land in existing communities. Uh, so we're talking about areas where infrastructure improvements and investments have already been made, where there's services, jobs, ideally areas where there's public transit uh, so people can live and work in Placer County. So we're talking about the commercial nodes that you're familiar with. I know it's hard to glean anything from that map, but we're North Auburn, Bowman, uh, Penryn, Newcastle, Granite Bay, Forest Hill, Alpine Meadows. These are the commercial nodes throughout the unincorporated areas of the county. It wouldn't apply within the Tahoe Basin Area Plan, and nor would it apply in these other specific plans. The, uh, the project, the Housing Code Amendments, is a very comprehensive packet of, of amendments. Um, there are four primary components. It's very technical, uh, but I will still try and touch on these at a high level. Uh, the first component involves amendments to the general plan. These are very targeted to two of the tables in the general plan regarding increases in floor area ratios and high density residential designations and adding commercial uses as permissible in high density residential designations. Similarly, allowing some multifamily uses in, in some of the different commercial zone districts and adding notes that floor area ratios can be used to calculate mixed use density not to exceed 30 units an acre. So what does all that mean? It, it, it's really providing uh, the opportunity for mixed use, commercial uh, facilities with housing component. The second component is amendments, uh, zoning text amendments to the zoning ordinances. This includes 
uh, establishment of a new mixed use zone district and land use there is no rezone into mixed use at this time but someone in the future uh, could propose that or the county might undertake a more comprehensive look at mixed use zoning as part of a housing element program uh, this would allow more multifamily and employee housing by right consistent with these objective design standards that I'm going to talk about uh, in a moment uh, we're talking about different alternative types of, of cluster housing um, co-housing cottage housing uh, there are housing uh, types geared towards agricultural and cooperative production where where the development is clustered in a certain area of the lot and the remainder is is conserved as open space or used for farming uh, movable tiny home communities so there are very uh, various cluster housing types that are, are uh, different than the standard kind of you know apartments townhomes and detached single-family residential that we have in uh, throughout the county number three uh, there's density and, and density bonus changes uh, in mobile home parks would increase from 8 to 12 units an acre uh, this would bring our ordinance consistent with uh, state law regarding density bonus and expand uh, that density bonus uh, basically about allowing for more units for certain types of affordable housing projects um, Again, it would introduce the, some more non-traditional uh, housing types like tiny homes on wheels or movable tiny homes that could be used as primary or secondary residences. The concept of dwelling unit equivalences where a studio would count differently than a three-bedroom apartment as it relates to development potential and, and, and build out. And the final bullet there, California and county already allows up to three units in single family zones a primary an ADU and a JADU there are about 200 parcels in the county uh, that uh, under our density bonus provision would uh, allow up to a fourth unit these are uh, very limited they're within uh, single-family residential zoning that is within a half mile of transit stops served by municipal sewer and water we're talking about house scale uh, units that and that fourth unit would have to be deed restricted to affordable housing uh, wrapping up the zoning text amendments there's a real uh, focus on on design and, and a shift uh, from more subjective regulations to objective standards uh, particularly for these mixed-use and multifamily housing types that uh, would go away from more discretionary requirements and become more ministerial consistent with standards uh, again providing some flexibility on things like parking height lot coverage greater floor area allowances and that really ties into the which is the third primary component of, of the housing related code amendments and that's this design manual uh, we've given the Commission updates at different points in the process on this but well what's important to note is uh, Senate bill 35 uh, you know basically if you're in certain zoning types that allow residential development and for certain project types like affordable housing the county can only rely on a, adopted objective design standards uh, and so um, you know uh, this would basically with our focus in terms of uh, infill housing in existing communities uh, this is really looking at transitional requirements buffer requirements and looking at how these additional housing uh, could be included in and in, in fit well within our existing established communities the fourth component this is technical uh, Placer County has uh, combining zone districts and um, there's four of them that I kind of want to talk about the dash B is the minimum building site dash UP is combining use permit and dash DL is design limitation uh, or density limitation those three combining districts all have their own kind of substitute development standards uh, in the case of UP it would require every project with that designation to come before the Planning Commission and, and uh, receive discretionary approval so uh, we're really trying to shift away from some of these um, uh, combining districts and, and back towards the base zoning and consistency with the design review requirements so the design review is, is the fourth uh, combining district listed there and let me try and explain what this means uh, there's a couple of exhibits here on the screen the top left is is North Auburn the top right is Granite Bay just for comparison 
And so it, it, all the cover you see in North Auburn, that's the Highway 49 corridor. Red is commercial, <laughs> green is uh, multifamily, a yellow or the orange yellow. Uh, that is uh, single family residential zoning within a half mile of transit. So you, you kind of get a sense when you look at the communities, where are we focused? We're focused on the, the commercial uh, hubs, the town centers, if you will, areas that are, are within uh, proximity of, of transit. Uh, comparatively, Granite Bay, um, you know, doesn't have transit currently. Uh, it's, it's commercial and multifamily zoned areas are primarily along Douglas Boulevard. Um, so, you know, not as many changes affected uh, there. But just trying to give a sense of the focus. These combining district zone changes won't affect any base zoning. So we're talking about properties with uh, commercial and uh, multifamily residential base zoning, and, and, and they would retain that base zoning. And so a few examples uh, at the bottom table there, and Placer County kind of has zoning sentences here. So uh, that first example would be C1UPDC is a neighbor, neighborhood commercial with a combining use permit and combining design review requirement. Uh, again, the proposed zoning would eliminate that use permit requirement and uh, rely on the table within uh, the zone district in terms of what requires a use permit and what just requires zoning clearance and, and uh, rely on these uh, objective design review requirements established with the design manual. Uh, the second example, multifamily residential with a density limitation of eight units per acre. That density limitation would be uh, removed with its substitute standards, again, relying on on uh, these adopted design manuals for these different types of multifamily and mixed use housing. And finally example, uh, there are you know, gonna be examples where there's more than one of these combining districts that needs to be removed. But you'll see in most of the examples, we're talking about commercial multifamily areas that are along major corridor routes. Most of them already have a design review requirement. Uh, this is just a shift from you know, more subjective guidelines that do things that encourage and don't have much teeth to uh, really uh, defining, you know, what we want these types of projects to look like and how they will fit within our community. So again, that's the fourth component of these overarching housing related code amendments, general plan amendments, zoning ordinance, text amendments, uh, the adoption of the design manual and changes to uh, zoning maps as it relates to these uh, combining districts. Timeline for the project, the notice of preparation was published August 29th, 2019. Uh, the comment period ran through September 27th of 2019. We had a scoping meeting in this room on September 18th, 2019, and the draft EIR was released January 21st of this year. Uh, people who commented on the NLP, uh, newspapers, state and federal agencies, public agencies, schools, uh, recipients of our housing newsletter, county staff all received notice uh, <coughs> that the draft EIR is available. We analyzed uh, the full range of environmental areas, so I'm not going to read all of those off, uh, but most of them uh, have either no impact or less than significant impact. So. Uh, for agricultural and forestry resources, hazards and hazardous material, hydrology, water quality, land use and planning, mineral resources, noise, population and housing, public services, recreation and utilities and service systems, transportation and wildfire, there was no mitigation, there was no uh, impact to those resource areas. There were a number of areas that did have mitigation, but, uh, you know, we're talking about things like light sources uh, relating to aesthetics, compliance with air pollution control districts uh, regarding best uh, management practices and best construction practices or discovery of naturally occurring asbestos during construction. There are a number of mitigation measures uh, to uh, survey and protect and avoid biological resources, to follow best management practices and compliance with energy efficiency. Uh, there are geotech requirements uh, and um, mitigation for placement of facilities on expansive soil or if you were to destruct a unique paleontological resource. There are greenhouse gas emissions requiring installation of electric appliances and new construction, encouraging things like vehicle charging stations. There's hydrology and water quality mitigations, drainage reports, and staying out of floodplains, uh, tribal 
cultural resources to avoid uh, archaeology archaeological resources so uh, the point is you know yes there are some impacts these sort of mitigations this is just standard stuff we hold any project uh, accountable to these sort of requirements what we're talking about here is what we're trying to accomplish at a programmatic level is a challenge because we don't know exactly where these projects were, will occur but it is uh, you know safe to say that there are the protections in place that when site-specific projects come in they will be evaluated and uh, additional mitigation could be required there was some uh, one uh, significant and unavoidable impact uh, in the draft EIR that is related to cultural resources again this is just due to the uncertainty of of uh, where these projects would be and uh, basically concluded that uh, there is no additional mitigation necessary that the current general plan policies and county ordinances cover this type of impact. Um, there were uh, three alternatives uh, looked at in accordance with CEQA, the no project alternative, the no workforce housing alternative, and the reduced intensity alternative. Um, the no project alternative would just have the same impacts identified in the adopted general plan. Uh, the no workforce housing alternative would exclude workforce housing for caretaker and employee housing. It really wouldn't uh, reduce the number of potential units that could be developed throughout the county. Um, and the reduced intensity uh, would re eliminate that density bonus provision that would allow four plexes on these low density residential lots within half mile of transit that would re result in a reduced uh, potential of, of development and, and a, a corresponding redu uh, reduction in potential impacts. Um, but you know when you look at the the differences i mean the no project is less than significant the other the project and and the no workforce housing the reduced intensity they all have less than significant in mitigation measures the cultural resources always uh significant and unavoidable so that's not to say that there aren't you know differences amongst uh the the various alternatives there, there are but they're really at a policy level and you know whether we allow cluster housing or, or tiny homes on wheels you know it, it's still you know uh, housing and so uh, you know they, they don't have a difference in terms of the environmental outcome um, there will be additional opportunities for public input uh, beyond just today's meeting the, the draft environmental document is being circulated for 45 days that runs through March 8th of this year uh, anyone who prepare or who provides a, a, res, uh, a comment, uh, all of those comments will be responded to and contained within the EI, uh, final EIR. This project will be coming back to you for recommendation to the Board of Supervisors here in the spring, and we anticipate uh, Board of Supervisors entitlements, probably not the right word, it, it's amendment hearings uh, later in the spring. So that uh, concludes uh, staff's presentation. Happy to answer any questions from the commission, or we can just open it up to take comments on the draft EIR. Let's start with the commission. Thank you, Patrick. Any uh, questions or comments from the commission? Okay, Dan. Uh, you clearly have lived this for quite some time, and that was a very good, uh, very comprehensive <laughs> talk. Um, I've lived it for less than a week, so yeah. please bear with me a little bit here. Um, but I had, uh, I found the EIR, frankly, to be pretty confusing. Now, that obviously is uh, somewhat related to the fact that I'm new to this, but um, I'm going to step you through a variety of different things here, and uh, hopefully some of them will be useful as you put together the final EIR, um, and maybe there's some food for thought as well, and perhaps you can help me understand a little bit about, you know, why we approach these things the way we have, at least in this particular case. <clears throat> Uh, so that it'll benefit me in the future as well. So um, just a, a quick administrative comment so you know the second paragraph of the executive summary, second sentence, um, is obviously an important sentence, but it is not a sentence. So you may want to take a look at that. I don't remember enough of uh, eighth grade English to tell you what's missing, but there's something missing. Um, more to the point, though, and more specifically uh, in terms of uh, kind of a broader question here, 
I had a problem understanding from the EIR the scope of the EIR. Uh, I'll explain why by stepping through several points here. Um, so please bear with me as I do that. <clears throat> uh, your explanation helped me, so that may be a good baseline for perhaps some adjustments to the language in the EIR. I don't know. Um, <clears throat> But uh, Executive Summary 1, page page 1, this uh, document targets amendments to the Placer County General Plan, County Zoning Ordinances, Zoning Maps, Community Design Guidelines. I think that's an exact phrase that you used as well, or basically the same type of thing. Um, and then it goes on to say that it uh, uh, allows more variation in the development areas where infrastructure and development already exists. Okay, so that gives me an idea that, first of all, we're talking about a fairly broad scope of a document. This actually affects everybody's planning documents in unincorporated placer. Is that a true statement? Yes. Okay. But at the same time, it doesn't focus broadly inside of those plans. In other words, um, it really tries to drive to places where infrastructure and development already exists, correct? That's correct. Okay. Then um, in some of the mitigation statements that are articulated in the document as you step through it, like for example, uh, ES3, part of the mitigation statement, the document specifies that projects are located, um, that projects that are located on, quote, underdeveloped parcels in areas where, uh, in areas that are surrounded by limited urban development uh, will include a lighting plan. So that's uh, a mitigation strategy associated with a lighting plan. So this is where I got confused because I literally stepped from ES1 to ES3 and now you're talking about a mitigation strategy associated with um, underdeveloped parcels in areas that are surrounded by limited urban development. So do you understand where I'm getting the disconnect here? Because literally on ES1 you talk about where infrastructure and development already exists and then ES3, you discuss underdeveloped areas. Now, the reason I think this is important is because this goes to the scope of the whole document. The fact is, are we addressing, or the question is, are we addressing underdeveloped, undeveloped areas as well here? Are we going to modify plans associated with those areas as well or not? The answer is... <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, we're certainly looking, I mean, uh, m most of these communities are built out, but we, yeah, we're looking for those parcels that were kind of left behind and, and where those opportunities exist. And, and I think that, you know, some of the, the broadness in the language just reflects the different characteristics of these communities from very rural areas to more suburban areas. But, you know, th those areas that are more on the fringes, uh, maybe adjacent to single family residential zoning or, you know, those lighting plans uh, would ensure that there's no light spillage, that sort of thing. Okay. Uh, but certainly, you know, we're, we're targeting these these areas that, uh, you know, we can continue to, uh, I shouldn't say continue, but in terms of meeting uh, population projections and housing needs, I mean, we have room to, to sprawl, if you will, to grow in the more rural areas of the county. It's going to take a long time because of the yeah. infrastructure limitations. So this is really a matter of where do we want to see that future housing uh, and 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 it will certainly relate to the timing of it because by having these uh, infrastructure in place that will accelerate the construction of these houses. Okay, I guess Patrick, all I'm. Patrick, this this is Sal Zeff from ICF. Yes, I, I should have introduced in I, my, my our environmental consultant uh, Sally Zeff from ICF and Sean Purvines, uh, the deputy director of Cedra, is also here uh, to help address your okay. questions. Thank you. And, and I, I thought I might have a, a clarification for the commissioner that might address your your concern. So some of the mitigation measures are addressing impacts that might only occur in some areas, not so that's not limiting where the project applies, but. When, it, when the project is implemented, when the, the changes to the um, policies and ordinances are implemented, impacts, some impacts may only occur in some areas. And so this mitigation measure, mitigation measure AES2, that the commissioner is talking about, is talking about where specific impacts might occur in undeveloped area, underdeveloped areas. So it's not about limiting where the, where the project occurs, 
but where, about where some impacts might occur. Right. Yeah. I just, I guess all I'm saying is, and perhaps you have to do this from a legal perspective or something, but if you, if you, if you narrow the scope of the document and then you go to a mitigation strategy which appears to indicate that the document is very broad in scope, that then gives the authority of the county or whomever to take broad action in the future perhaps to modify, for example, the Granite Bay Community Plan. Which is, a, which is a community that I represent. Uh, so I just want to make sure I understand what authority we're really giving to the county <clears throat> by using this EIR. And, and so when you make references to places like underdeveloped uh, infrastructure areas, it, it just seems to, it seems to make the document more broad in scope um, and provide more authority to the county than uh, I would have anticipated we would want to approve. That's all. Um, let, me, let me step to the next point uh, as well on this. Um, so on page 2-1 under project setting where there's information provided about, well, no, I'm sorry, I need to back up. Um, okay. Right. Uh, 2-1, we talk about the size of Placer and 150,000 residents, <clears throat> et cetera. So that would tend to indicate that we have a rather sweeping document that we're considering here. Um, on page 2-2, there's a list of community plans. There's 16 community plans listed there. And uh, according to the document, this is a quote, it says, none of these plans are proposed for amendment as part of the project. That yeah. includes the community of Granite Bay, for example, and probably communities associated with everybody on this panel. Yes. Um, so that's, that's a quote right out of the document. Then it goes on, however, uh, on page 3.11-15, there's a table that lists 23 community plans, including those listed on page 2-2. And it states, the project includes targeted amendments to the Placer County General Plan, Zoning Ordinance, MAPS, and community design manual, which would apply to the listed plans. Yeah, I, I, I understand how this could be confusing. I appreciate your questions. Maybe I could try and give a, an example uh, to Granite Bay that might help because we aren't uh, changing any of the community plans. So if a project on a vacant parcel came in, say on Douglas Boulevard, that community plan has very specific design guidelines for landscaping and frontage requirements along Douglas Boulevard. Those would still apply. If the project was mixed use or multifamily, then these new design standards that apply countywide would apply to the actual project. So there, it, it, it really will, depending on the project type, involve a combination of community plan uh, standards as well as standards for this. You know, again, these are very specific to just housing housing related project yeah okay but so it does affect this this project probably affects every single representative here and every supervisor's district correct that's that, okay. yes this is for the, the so yeah. the only caution I have then is that on page 2-2 where it says quote none of these plans are proposed for amendment as part of the project, you review that language. At least it does, that does not appear to be um, an accurate statement. Obviously, if it's inaccurate, it's a mistake. You know, I'm not implying other than that. No. It's just that it may be a, an error. No, it's just a fact of how all these plans, you know, relate to one another and augment each other, and not all of them have... Uh, you know everything addressed completely within each one, uh, but I, I thank you for your comment, and we, we will review that language as it relates to effects on community plans. Okay, uh, thank you for that. Can you can you elaborate a little bit about uh, why we include references to 194 units in this plan? Uh, th and I touched on it, but. Uh, it, this, these are these 200, well, 194 parcels that are, have base zoning of single family residential. 
that are served by municipal sewer and water and are within a half mile of transit. There, uh, you know, there's some in North Auburn, there's some up in the squat, like Highway 89 area, and there's none in Granite Bay because you're not served by transit. Those single family residential parcels already allow three units. This would be a, an above and beyond, which would enable them to get four. That fourth would be deed restricted to affordable housing. And again, it's, it's just in these, uh, you know, very focused areas along these major transportation routes. So um, the, 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 this, we're not talking about four detached individual houses. We're talking about, you know, kind of carving up the biggest house you can imagine in the community and having four units within it. So these are intended to be the scale uh, of the existing community. And, and you put this in this EIR as an example? You know, I don't know if they, I would use the example. When, you know, I think when we started this, I don't know that the state allowed three at that time. So it was kind of sweeping at the time. Now that they already allow three, uh, it is just one more. It is in these focus areas. It would require deed restrictions for affordability. I'm not sure how many people would take advantage of it, but it is just one step that make, you know, helps us meet our, uh, you know, these regional housing allocation numbers to show that we have the capacity for the anticipated growth in the county. Okay. But, but that, that's an example of something where, you know, the, your recommendation or the board, they may say, that's not a great idea. We don't want those, you know, 194 fourth units. And that's okay. It's not going to change the, the environmental document. Uh, so those policy decisions that are yet to come, um, you know, they, they really don't have an impact, you know, in terms of uh, what was covered. Okay. I, I'm, I'm, I'm really just trying to understand precisely the scope of the document because we're not talking about individual projects at this point, right? So, so I, I'm getting there, I think. But, um, you know, we also talk about the Sacramento Council of Governments or whatever right. that Same thing is that, yeah. uh, you know, I heard about two days ago. Um, so, and that has tasked us or asked us or supports the creation of 7,900 units or whatever the number is. I think that's the number between now yeah. and 2020. I mean, we're, we're, we're projecting a shortfall in terms of the units that are, you know, allocated to the jurisdiction and the units that will actually get, we anticipate to be developed in that time frame. Not surprisingly, you know, a lot of the people that, um, you know, fall within that need area are, are in different income levels that don't always uh, allow for market rate housing. So, um, you know, this helps us meet our housing allocation uh, from SACOG, and it does focus on providing a, a range of housing types that provide more affordability and, and concentrate those areas in uh, existing developed communities. Okay, so it is a this is a very sweeping change. Uh, the, the, these are a everyone. comprehensive set of policy amendments that, either way you go, don't really have a big change in form in terms of environmental impacts. These are, yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So this is a sweeping document, in my view, uh, and so I understand the scope better now. Thank you for that. Um, the second second. Substantive question, I guess I have is, uh, I, I would characterize as, as one word, why? And this will help me understand, you know, probably future approaches from the county on, on how we do these things. Um, <clears throat> so why would we do this rather than address these issues when we do individual projects? John, do you want to try? I Good afternoon. I'm Shauna Purvines um, with Community Development Resources Agency. Uh, so just to kind of take a step back, I, as you just said, you've learned about SACOG a couple of days ago. Um, so under California state law, uh, so it's beyond SACOG, the, the full California law requires all local jurisdictions in the state of California to accommodate a certain fair share of housing. That is the regional housing allocation that comes down through the Department of Finance to the different uh, regional uh, groups, are called SACOG, um, that then is given out to each jurisdiction. So for uh, Placer County, uh, and, and I should take one more step back, 
Um, the state also mandates a housing element uh, be adopted in each jurisdiction as part of their general plan. That housing element is required to identify the ways by which you will meet that RENA, what we call RENA. Um, and so in our housing elements, we look for ways to reduce the constraints to the development of housing. So as part of this project, this was an opportunity to go back into some of our uh, more general codes, so the general plan, the county zoning ordinance, um, and to our design guidelines at the time, and look for where there are areas where we can reduce those constraints. And, the, and so this is a package of those items that were determined by a number of different things like Patrick talked about. One, we interviewed some of our builders and our developers that have you know, processed uh, applications, building permits, uh, through the county to determine what some of those hurdles they had uh, were and where we might be able to help streamline that development. Uh, we also did a comprehensive kind of look at other jurisdictions who had uh, successfully uh, modified their codes and ordinances and, and had some success with streamlining their development, so we looked at those. Um, and then we just took straight out of state law, though since about 2017 we've had a substantial amount of changes in state law. Um, that are directing local jurisdictions uh, where we're going to streamline it. And Patrick mentioned one of those, which is SB 35. Um, so kind of taking all those together, we went through our general codes, our general plans, our general zoning, um, and look for those areas where we could um, identify and make those modifications so projects could come through more um, uh, quickly through the process. Um, many of the projects still are going to require some level of discretionary review. Um, they'll just be applied these standards um, or these new these new changes. Um, where community plans, I know the question came up with community plans. Community plans are essentially uh, considered general plans. Um, so where those community plans, and, and all of them are very different, very different. None of them look the same. Um, some rely more on county zoning. Others rely uh, less on zoning and have their own zoning built into them. So where those community plans would rely on more general policies, they would fall back to these general policies. Where those community plans have their own specific uh, requirements or guidelines, then those would be applied. So um, each, each community is just a little bit different. This package is really just dealing to the general, the general plan, general zoning, and the general um, multifamily mixed use design okay. standards. Uh, you, did, you did say, though, this, will, this is designed to help streamline the process of bringing these projects forward. Correct. Right? This is kind of the crux of my, if I had a concern, it would be that. Mm -hmm. Because this affects 21, 23 community plans, all of which are represented on this panel, all of which will be represented by the supervisors. And um, I'm not confident that I'm willing to say that Granite Bay wants small houses on wheels. Um, so we need to make sure that each one of those projects be addressed properly, and that's not what, and we are not today or in the future when we consider the CIR final, saying that that's a good idea for Granite Bay or any other location represented here. So today each is panel. just to the to the comments on the draft EIR okay. and the adequacy of the EIR. Yeah. Okay. Um, this is, a, it's just an interesting way to approach this. I, I'm just not sure I understand still to this. One of the things maybe I could, one of the things we have to look at is the general plan is our constitution. Everything has to be consistent with the general plan. Granite Bay specific plan, other specific plans have to be consistent with the general plan and constitution. And then you start moving down into the zoning code. All of those things have to be consistent. So one of the things the EIR looks at is to make sure all is consistent. So as a project comes into Granite Bay, the project shall be, it has to be consistent with the Granite Bay community plan. It cannot do something that is not allowed by that community plan. So as a commission, that's what we're obligated to look at as projects come through, including the staff when okay. they're doing a project review, they have to determine that that project is consistent with the general plan, the community plan, and then the zoning code. So it, it's a tiered system where everything has to be consistent. The EIR looks at that consistency. And so it's not going in and adjusting the community plan. Okay. Other than, I mean, and maybe in some ways, uh, I mean, the state of California uh, has done some sweeping uh, changes. Uh, for one, uh, if you have multifamily housing, 
you know, uh, if you had a limit of 30 feet, now I think you can go up to 60 feet. Why? The state just saying you can do this and you can increase your density by 50 percent. County has nothing to say about it. That's a use by right. The state has made that determination. So there are some things the state of California has determined for this county that we have no say over. And it does impact the community plan, but the state trumps the general plan. The state trumps the community plan. Sure. sure. It's just interesting to me that we're, this requires an EIR when it appears to be uh, actions associated with policies that support statute. So, I mean, you know, if this has been a, if this is a law, why are we writing an EIR on it? I mean, you know. Because it, we're, we're interpreting the law as a county. We're interpreting the law and adding new zoning codes or uh, changes that do have to be evaluated under CEQA. Okay. Yeah, and if, if I could just add one point. Uh, the state legislature obviously makes the laws. Um, once the county then enacts those laws, any action that the county takes still has to be subject to that environmental review. So even though the state says you have to do this, if the county is going to take undertake any of its own action, it has to evaluate each of those to see if there is going to be an environmental impact. Um, and in this situation, it's looking at the the county is looking at the housing element and updating its housing element, so it has to look at the environmental impacts of that update. Um, and okay. depending on the level of impacts, depends on the level of environmental review. Here we have an environmental impact report, um, and that's it's largely saying that the impacts are being reduced, and, and these changes are more um, processing changes that won't have big environmental impacts. But we still have to go through that process um, when we're making when the county's making a formal change to something. Okay. Well, when when this comes back, I would say this: I would like to clearly understand what's law. What's Sacramento County of Government's Council? What's who's telling us to do what? Obviously, if it's law, then this is easy to figure out. But if this is some council of governments, then perhaps it's not law. Perhaps it's just a recommendation, whatever. Mm -hmm. We need to understand who's telling us to do what here, because frankly, um, I found the EIR to be quite confusing in this area. There's just, we, we kind of scattershot a bunch of different things into this, including 196 units, including it can be in, you know, all over the county. It can, 21 plans, but actually 16. It doesn't apply to, but in fact it does. Those kinds of issues are in there. Um, and a, a couple of more specific things. Um, I, I uh, because there's no specific, uh, project here. This is a difficult thing, I think, from an EIR writer's perspective to get your arms around. But I've got to say, it was mystifying to read in some ways. So this, this proposal deals with um, all of the community plans and the general plan, and et cetera, et cetera. And yet, we found no impact whatsoever for land use and planning public services, recreation, utilities, service systems, and transportation. No impact. No mitigation. No nothing. Just no impact. So let's take a look at two of these real quickly. 3.11-20 uh, discusses environmental impacts of land use and planning. And according to the document, it says CEQA requires that an EIR consider if a project will, quote, conflict with any applicable land use plan, policy, or regulation that was adopted for the purpose of avoiding or mitigating an environmental impact. That's a quote. So what you're telling me when you say there's no impact is that you have considered 21 different plans and concluded that there's no impact to uh, land use and planning, yet the whole purpose of this document is to modify all of these plans. True? So the, the, the proposed changes do not modi modify any of the community plans. Um, and the impacts are looking at, and, and Sally Zeff with ICF can also address this, looks at any new impacts. So basis of what we are, what's allowed today and looks at, the, the, based on the change, will it actually create a new impact? So it did go back through and look at all the plans and then uh, determined if, based on this change, is there a, a, a determination of a new impact that would be created by this change. 
Um, so at this point, and, and as was stated before, there's no proposed amendments to the community plans as part of this. Okay, so uh, page 3.11-15, I'm sorry, I've been returning to that. Community plans are listed in this table, including those listed on page 2-2 and states, the project includes targeted amendments to the Placer County General Plan, zoning ordinances, maps, and community design manuals, which would apply to the listed plans. Correct. So, go, so going back to the, the community plans themselves, each community plan is very different. So some community plans are just policy documents, others are more policy document with some zoning, some are policy documents, zoning, and have design standards. They're all very different. So looking at what was being proposed here, it did not affect change, something that's been adopted in a community plan. It does not necessitate going in and amending in a community plan. So um, it doesn't mean that areas in plans might not be subject to these things. It just means that the plan itself, did the, the document, did not need to be amended as part of these changes. Okay. Um, so, well, I won't even bother with the second one because, uh, but because the same logic applies, I guess. But this is the only caution I have, or the only statement I have here is this: this is a sweeping document, I think. Uh, this is this will fundamentally affect the complexion of housing across the county it appears to me and the direction that we go some of which is directed by statute apparently yes 30 or whatever it's 35 I read that uh, to the best of my ability understood some of it um, and and you know I understand that and some of it is some of it is optional or whatever but uh, this is a significant document so I suggest that at least you take some of these uh, points and take a look at that when you do the final EIR because I will really want to understand what we are really doing with this document when it comes forward for final review. All right. Thank you. Other commissioner questions? Yes. Nathan. Uh, Patrick, I have a quick question. I think <laughs> it's quick. Put you on the spot. Um, Thank you. Can you go back to your zoning sentence slide? I like that phrase that you used um, because I think it's important for clarification. Yeah, okay. So here we have the existing zoning, proposed zoning codes. And on the left, the existing codes, I, you know, each one of those letters and numbers means something. Right. They, they have a meaning. Uh, and then when we go to the right, you know, there's some more consolidation of that. Um, I guess what I'm asking is, is are all of those letters and numbers somehow still represented in the proposed zoning so it, it's not lost? Because I guess I'm also asking, what is lost in, in simplifying the code? Yeah. Or, or are those all assumed now by minister, ministerial or assumptions in the proposed zoning? Uh, thank you for the question. It, it, it's really um, a shift in terms of more what type it is. So things like lot sizes and setbacks and such still apply, but as opposed to being applied at a, a, a zoning combining district level, it's really based on are we talking about townhomes? Are we talking about fourplexes? Are we? Because each of those has kind of different standards. So the short answer is no, none of this gets lost. It's just uh, recaptured and, and you know simplified and, and really reliance on the base zoning and these new established standards for these different housing types and gets rid of kind of more of the, you know, the, the scattershot compiling these combining districts together to get what you're really looking for, which we think we have accommodated in okay. this new design manual. Okay, thanks. Okay. But it's complicated. Other questions of the commission? All right. Let me see. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Just for maybe clarification, where you, where the UP is dropped, right? That means that uh, it's by right, and not by uh, 
It, it, it just it? defers. So the C1 is a neighborhood commercial. It will have its own use table. Those uses that are permissible are going to range from different commercial uses to public service uses. All of these different individual uses are going to have their own level of entitlement. So anything that is has potential to be in conflict is going to have still require some sort of minor use permit or conditional use permit. But where you know where you're designated for multifamily zoning and you're basing it on objective standards, you know th those that that would shift away more towards ministerial. Um, so instead of just this blanket statement that everything here requires a use permit, it's really more subject to what those individual uses are, and certainly a number of them still will require a use permit if there's any likelihood that there's going to be any you know loss of enjoyment or quality of life for surrounding properties. Okay, that clarifies it. Thank you very much. Okay. All right, if there's no other comments of the commission, it's time to open the public comment period. Are there any individuals in the audience? Don't see any. Do we have anyone who, uh, who's raised their hand? Okay. So we do have public comment. Ms. Jasper, please unmute your mic. You'll have three minutes. Thank you. Marilyn Jasper, speaking on behalf of Public Interest Coalition. Um, Commissioner Woodward's, if I have the name right, comments are greatly appreciated. We realize this is an EIR discussion, but uh, just want to bring up two points. To many environmental advocates, the word, quote, streamline, <clears throat> unquote, is, is often a red flag. I won't take time to give examples of how, how some of the grave concerns come about and have merit as soon as something is streamlined. Um, second, with the fourth unit, affordable housing, in some cases, affordable housing, uh, it, uh, when it's permitted, it, it comes with significant financial breaks, huge permitting, permit cost reductions, are granted, but if this EIR is to cover impacts, the amendment needs to be specific in writing and enforceable, the language that is, as to when or if the affordable housing overlay or the code expires. It, uh, to me, affordable housing should be in perpetuity. You got those breaks, you're, you're there. It, uh, but it goes with the property. And some expire in amazingly, ridiculously short years and then revert back to market rate housing and the whole uh, benefit of being affordable is lost. So I hope, uh, and, and then there would be impacts that are in the future, but I hope the EIR would either make sure the language is in there to make sure that doesn't happen or um, mitigate the impacts. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Do we have other comments? No. All right. Seeing no other comments, uh, we will close the public comment period. Uh, any further commission discussion before this item is turned <coughs> I do. Oh, we have another discussion item. Go ahead. No more public? No nope, public stuff. Oh. Okay, well, I have... Uh, a few comments here, and uh, <coughs> I'm going to qualify these as all editorial, not uh, substantial. Okay. okay, so if we could uh, show the map, uh, figure 2.2-2, projects under uh, county jurisdiction. You get that up on the screen. Yeah, I'm not sure if I can do that. Was that one of the maps it was, in the slide? Oh, it was, was that large okay. county map. Sorry, I didn't have the figure. Uh, no problem. There. Oh. Say yes. Okay. Uh, on this map, and this is really a minor point, but uh, you look where Tahoma is, and you go west, and you see a large block of uh, commercial zoning. Tahoma. And west, okay. And uh, at least the map I have shows that as being national forest land, and the access is very poor. Yeah. And so I question why 
that would even be necessary to show on this map because it's certainly not available for anything in the county unless you know it's exchanged with the Forest Service so that's just a it looks comment. like kind of an anomaly you typically don't see this higher intensity zoning out in the forest like that so yeah. we'll have to look into whether that's some public service uh, yeah just caught my eye yeah. sorry about that <laughs> no it's good catch <laughs> Okay, when we get back to... Uh, and again, none of it applies within the Tahoe Basin area plan because the... Right, well, that's outside the Tahoe Basin. Oh, okay, all right. Yeah. Because all, all this gray-shaded area would represent uh, that TRPA jurisdiction. Right. But okay. The red square is outside. Yep, yeah, got it. Okay, so I, I would suggest that you drop that, but it's up to you guys. Okay, uh when we get to uh, the water part of this, and I have 3.10-8, and there's a listing of uh, several, well, of the, of the upper American River watershed and shows several lakes and reservoirs in El Dorado County, as well as uh, like French Meadows, Hell Hole, and uh, Lake Valley and Placer County. But it doesn't show Sugar Pine Reservoir which really is a source of water for the Forest Hill community. And so probably, you know, it's not a big point, but by leaving that out, uh, you know, yeah. people are going to pick up on that. Okay. And then I also might mention someplace in here where you're listing, where there's a listing of water districts. Yes. I didn't notice the Forest Hill Public Utilities District uh, listed as a water district. And so that would need to be corrected. Okay. Uh, maybe just two more editorial things. Oops, I lost one. Uh, fire stations. And the listing is, and this is on 3.15-16. And it lists uh, a lot of full-time Placer County fire stations, which... To me, it looks like those are the ones that are contract stations with the county. But also, uh, there's fire stations in the Tahoe area, particularly at uh, North Star, Squaw Valley, and a portion of the North Tahoe fire district includes Alpine Meadows. And so I think those should probably be listed. Also, Meta Vista and Forest Hill and Newcastle and uh, Penryn all have their own fire departments, as well as uh, Forest Hill. And so uh, at least I would suggest that maybe uh, get more complete list of the fire stations in Placer County. Thank you. And then maybe finally, I guess the area where I'm a little bit confused is the 89 corridor. It's got listed uh, 41 units. It's the biggest number of units in the east side of the county. And when I look at the map of that corridor, it's very complex with uh, predominantly national forest land. A lot of small parcels in there that uh, actually are developed with cabins and pretty fancy cabins. And maybe a little bit of uh, land around the mouth of Squaw Valley. But I think when the focus of the east side of the county is going to be on 41 units in the 89 corridor, that uh, maybe a little bit more explanation of what we're talking about there in terms of availability of the land and how uh, that might interact with the public lands that surround it. So that would be just an idea, a suggestion. I guess that's my comments. And as you can see, they're not substantial. They're all editorial. But at any rate, it might help improve the document. Thank you. Insurance. Thank you. Other commissioner comments? If not, Patrick, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, and we'll see you again this spring. I look forward to it. All right. The next timed item is the AT&T cell tower appeal of the zoning administrator's denial of a minor use permit. And I understand, Mr. Evaldi, you have some comment. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Uh, yeah, the AT&T cell tower appeal of uh, the zoning administrator's denial of a minor use permit. Uh, we need to uh, resend out a corrected notice. And so I'm going to ask that you continue that to an open date, but the intention is uh, to, uh, to bring it back on February 25th. 
But if uh, you want to uh, leave it open, they leave it open. Uh, day. We okay. have, we do have a couple of holidays coming up, so uh, we're we're pretty certain we can get that out uh, right. in time to meet our legal deadlines. <laughs> uh, but open date gives us that flexibility. All right. So I'll ask for a motion to continue this item to a date uncertain. Actually, uh, oh. before a motion, we should open up to public comment. Oh, thank you. Didn't see that on that list, but uh, so at this point in time, uh, we'll open it up for public comment. Is there anyone in the audience? I don't see anyone. And Sue, do we have anyone raising their hand? Okay. So with that, we'll close the public comment period and ask uh, Commissioner to make a motion to continue this item to a uh, date uncertain. I'll make a motion that we continue <laughs> item five on the agenda, AT&T cell tower appeal of the zoning administrator's denial of a minor use permit, PLN 19-00212 until a, a future date open. Second. We have a first and a second. Roll call, please. <clears throat> I have a first from Mr. Herzog, a second from Mr. Sevison. So a vote from Mr. Cannon, please. Yes. Mr. DiMatteo? Yes. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Woodward? Yes. Mr. Herzog? Yes. Mr. Sevison? Yes. Mr. Howgie? Yes. Thank you. With that, concludes the uh, Planning Commission meeting for today. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you.